Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. This is Dr. Thomas Richard Easley. We're here at Morning with the Doc. Hope everyone is doing well today. Um, today I'm really excited because today is the birthday of St. Pauline Murray, November 20th, 2016. Uh, she would be, if she was alive today, she was born in 1910, she would be 106 years old. And so I am uh, wishing St. Paula Murray a happy birthday. And uh, in honor of her, if you are in the area, please come out to uh, in Durham. Come out to 1313 Halley Street at Lyon, L-Y-O-N Park. We will be celebrating Polly Murray today, uh, doing a concert and as well as a play in her honor. So join me in saying happy birthday to, to Polly Murray. And I'm real proud because as a hip-hop artist, my next album is dedicated to her. And um, and so I really want you all to check it out. But anyway, we're here to talk a little bit um, through things regard to church. As a Christian, I want to welcome all people here. Uh, I hope that you all are, let's say this, I know it's early, but let's say this. I'm going to use Dr. Charles Stanley's thing. Uh, he says, don't ever make critical decisions. Good morning, Miss Anders. He says, don't make critical decisions when you feel four, four ways. If you're too hungry, if you're angry, if you're lonely, or if you're tired. So I want to say this. I pray everyone has food in their stomach or you are you have access to food. And plus Thanksgiving is coming up this week. And I uh, hopefully people have some feel like they have something to give thanks for. I hope that you are emotionally peaceful or, you know, happy, um, you know, or joyful. I hope that you have people in your life or someone in your life, whether it's family, a significant other, a friend, to show you love and let you know that you deserve to be loved and can love on you the way that you want to be loved and that you're energized. So I hope everyone feels that way this morning. I know I do, and uh, and I'm real happy to be here with you all. So let's get the other formalities out of the way. You can follow me on youtube.com forward slash R-A-S-H-A-A-D, which I always uh, repost these there. Uh, Facebook.com, Rashad Easley, R-A-S-H-A-D-E-A-S-L-E-Y, or Facebook.com, Thomas Easley, if you just want to follow me kind of on the personal side. Uh, Instagram and Snapchat uh, and Twitter, all the same, Rashad E's, E-A-S. And uh, then, of course, you can email me at thomasreasley at easleybranch.com. So let's get into this word. Today at Peace, we're going to be talking about this topic. And the topic today is what comes natural to you. What comes natural to you. And I'll explain to you, I, I need to explain to you where this came from. So if you are in the United States and... Of course, you know, uh, I'm sure like, you know, last week for for a lot of people, depending on what side you sat on politically, you know, like what happened last week in our country, you know, with the with the results of the of the election, I think kind of in some ways it polarized a lot of people and got a lot of people feeling scared, you know, understandably, and some who are concerned. And then, of course, there are some that are really, really happy. And uh, there have been a lot of pundits, you know, out here talking. There have been a lot of philosophers talking. I think uh, one big person that a lot of people are looking at. Good morning, Talitha. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. Uh, a lot of people um, listen to uh, Van Jones. You know, Van Jones has been saying a lot. And I'm, I've been, you know, digging him and enjoying, you know, what he has to say. But another person that I liked, and it was a, it was a, it was a comedic personality. And I actually like listening to comedians. Because comedians, in my opinion, have a perspective about the world that most people are either, A, too naive to acknowledge or too afraid to, to, to look at. And on CBS, they interviewed uh, John Stewart. You know, and if anyone uh, remembers John Stewart, he used to, uh, he was the host of the show um, called The Daily Show. I think the person who hosted it now is a brother from South Africa, Trevor Noah. But John Stewart did it, and he did it for 16 years. And he has a 5 minute and 57 um Excerpt that, and I think you all, you know, you, if you got YouTube or Google, just Google it. John Stewart Trump, or John Stewart on the Trump election. Just look it up and listen to what he says. And we're going to talk about this in church. And the thing that he talks about is, he said America is not natural. America is not normal. And I thought that's one of the most profound things that is so true. America is not normal. He said we, our, our human state, basically, what I'm really doing is paraphrasing is we are tribal. You know, we 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 come together, you know, under similarities. We 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 come together, you know, with people that we feel comfortable with or that we feel, you know, you know, that we can trust and we feel who are just like us. And if you look in history, if you look in our society, as a matter of fact, even if you look academically, you can see that. Like I give you a question. Um 
statistically, do women perform better in college in mixed gender, um, uh, in, in, in a mixed gender environment, or in the same gender environment? Statistics have shown women perform better in same gender environments. You know, African Americans perform better in mixed ethnic or mixed race environments, so do they perform better in the same environment where they're among more so, you know, black people? And it shows that they perform better at historically black colleges and universities, you know. But it's not because we are, it's not because women can only perform around other women. It's not that at all. It's not that black people can only uh, demonstrate their brilliance around black people because that's not it at all either. It's when you're in an environment where people, ha you have this commonality with them. And so it becomes easier for you to exist in that environment because you don't have to think about those things that make you different, especially on the surface, right? So in some ways, when you don't have to think about that, you're not comparing yourself to other people, okay? You know what I'm saying? You know, like you're not, you're not uh, wasting that energy or using that energy, I should say, in comparison because now you can just focus on what you're doing because you look like everybody else and you kind of are in some ways just like everybody else. And so I want to take that and make that about diversity because one of the things that I often talk about in diversity is how when diversity comes up for certain populations, and sometimes in particular, you know, like white individuals, you know, but it can happen to anybody. It's like when that term comes up, it's like there's this IQ drop. It's like the intelligence that I had kind of goes down because you're because it's almost like it seems like when that word comes up, it triggers something in people, like something that's about either like anti-me or not me. Or in a way, for some people, it's like, well, I'm not in a dominant position, but it's about opening it up to everyone. And so I got to I gotta give John Stewart, you know, like a handshake. I wish I could just, you know, like grip that brother and say thank you for that. Because really, in my opinion, what you did was you described the problem with the solution at the same time. I feel like in our country, we really, or in our world, we spend a lot of times talking about the problems and just finding better ways to categorize the problems, which is really all we do. You know, like that's why terms like microaggressions, you know, like, uh, I mean, I love the term, but in essence, what is a microaggression? Well, when you say something, when, when you say something that triggers a different emotion in me, that makes me feel bad because I don't feel like you're valuing me or, you know, uh, you know, seeing me as an equal. So I feel like you just, you know, pinged me, microaggression. Parents do it to their children. Children do it to other children. The school teachers do it to children. Children do it to students. You know, but we have this nice term to say microaggressions. But what I like about what John Stewart said is he dealt with the human condition, and he said it's going to be hard. But we can get there. It's going to be hard, but we can get there. Now, when I think about Christianity, and I think about how we are in our human condition, I think about Jesus and what Jesus uh, actually promoted and what Jesus talked about. And really, this is just my opinion. What Jesus was talking about doesn't come natural to us. Like agape love, in my opinion, doesn't come natural to us. What, but that kind of love probably comes natural to a parent, to their child. You know, if you're a good parent, you know, like you have that unnatural, um, a hundred percent giving love for your family. So it's not so see, so that's the thing. I can see a parent doing that with their daughter or their son, but to ask that same family to do that for someone that's not their child. See, that's probably not going to come natural, <laughs> right? Because I want to protect what's mine. I want to protect my child. I want to protect my blood, you know, or in some cases, if I adopt a child and then, you know, that's my child, they become my family. But what about people who are not your family? What's your natural inclination? Or let's make it about violence for, for a minute. My natural inclination, if you hit me, my natural inclination is not to turn the other cheek. <laughs> as Jesus was saying in the Bible, or as even Martin Luther King did most times, you hit me, my natural inclination is to hit back, <laughs> you know, because my natural inclination is to protect myself because every human is built with this innate uh, desire or this scientific, I feel, or biological condition to survive, to take care of yourself. And so what I want to do is I want to talk about three different things briefly because I only got about 20 more minutes just to help us just kind of think about some things for a moment. So one, in the Bible, right, well, um, let me say it this way. I feel like we in the church, and I believe any r religious group or sect, we talk about thing, things in religious and spiritual terms. And I think that if we only talk about it in religious and spiritual terms, we miss the opportunity to really understand other individuals if we only speak about things in spiritual terms. So I'll give you an example. What do we say about Satan in the world? We say the devil is busy, 
Right. And let's say if you're having a good day, and while you're having that good day, let's say somebody bumps the back of your car. Boom, you know, you sit in the light and somebody bumps the back of your car. Your car, your 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 day just changed. <laughs> Some would say, in spiritual sense, that's God's way of testing you. <laughs> Some would say, then the devil must have been in that person's car if they weren't paying attention. You know, we make everything sometimes so overly spiritual without really paying attention to the human side of it, right? So in the Bible, in Ephesians 2, 1, 3, in that, in that, in that, in, in that, in that verse of the Bible, it talks about the devil being the prince of the air, Satan being the prince of the air. And so if I speak in spiritual terms when I'm talking to people, one of the reasons that I can tell people it's so important for us to really kind of, if you're a Christian, focus on Jesus, but focus on good things, is I can say, well, because if you were raised in this society and in this world, you've been exposed to Satan, right? Now, let's make this about the human condition for a moment. Let's kind of take that Let's take that spiritual stance of you've been, you know, that, you know, that, that, that you've been living under the air of Satan and let's make it human. Well, if you're born into a world where people are out here protecting themselves and if you're born into a world where people are selfish and they only care about themselves and if you're born into a world where people are afraid, you know, for their, for, for their own existence where racism and sexism and heterosexism exist and, and a number, you know, of, of other isms, instead of me just saying, oh man, you, you, you've been exposed to Satan, the prince of the air, I'm going to be like, well, you really, in my opinion, just been exposed to the human condition. You know, you, you have been exposed to a world that's not about selflessness, but you've been exposed to a world that's about selfishness. You know, you've been exposed to a world, you know, that is about take care of me, 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 mine. Let's talk about um, let's talk about creation for for a moment. Right. Genesis three, nine, nine through 13. When this is when God comes back to the Garden of Eden and he's looking for Adam. He's like, Adam, where are you? And he's basically asking Adam what happened and you know he says the woman that you gave me you know caused me you know to, to eat this apple you know and, and and adam said i was hiding from you because i was naked and god was like who told you that you were naked because they weren't supposed to not only know that they were naked but to be ashamed of being naked you know so then we take that we take that scripture and try to apply it to every other condition throughout the world well that's when sin first first entered the world and this is why we have sin now Let's make this about the human condition and go back to what happened in Genesis. Here you have a man and a woman in a garden. And a serpent, you know, came up to the woman. This is what people try to use just to say women are the, the weaker vessels, you know, but I don't believe that. But, you know, the serpent or this individual came up to a woman and he challenged her thinking. You know, it's what he did. You know, it's like if you eat off that apple, you won't die. You know, if you eat off of that, if you eat, if you eat that apple, then your mind is going to be open. So what he did was he tapped into the curiosity of this human being, because obviously, why would this apple even come up? Like, you know, unless you were curious about it. Right. And so some can say, well, see, that's the devil tempting you, you know, and that's the devil, you know, like telling you something different. But as a human, you know, but 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 as a human, if I'm curious about something, I'm automatically going to kind of defer to it and want to explore it a little bit more. You know, because I'm curious about it, you see. And so the serpent or the devil or however you want to, you know, call it, took advantage, you know, of her vulnerability, of her curiosity and got her to do something that she wasn't supposed to do. And so what I'm saying is that that scripture shows how weak and frail we can be if someone identifies or taps into a trigger of ours. But then it's also interesting if you go to Ecclesiastes 3, 1 through 8. And there's a time for everything. There's a time to love. There's a time to hate. There's a time to rest. There's a time to go to war. There's a time for peace. There's a time for everything. And I feel like Ecclesiastes does a really good job, also written by Solomon, that Ecclesiastes does a good job dealing with the human condition because it thinks with regard to wisdom, like talking about who and how we are as humans. Um, this week, I just, you know, like just to explain this a little bit more, um, th this week I had a meeting with one of my students uh it was a good meeting it was just a connecting meeting like i like to try to connect with all of my students in my class just to get to learn them more they get to learn me more it helps me learn how to help them more if i know how they learn and how they think and the experiences you know that, that they're going through so that i can align the material that i'm teaching to their experience which hopefully makes it easier for them to learn it because they can place themselves in it and go oh yeah this is for me so now i can do it and towards the end of our meeting, she said, ooh, something happened to me this week, though, Doc. I feel so stupid. And I was like, 
What happened? Now watch this. I'm going to tell y'all the for real. I, I want you to really. I, I want to walk you through the way that I'm thinking in my mind. I was like, okay, she's 18 years young because this is my intro class that I'm talking about. This is the first time off in college, and she said, "I feel stupid." Okay, so I was like, okay, nine times out of ten, well, usually when people say they feel stupid, see, now I'm, I'm not going to think like, what did the devil do? Let me think in human condition. An 18-year-old, this is the first time you're away from your parents. So usually when people say I feel stupid, what probably do you feel stupid about? It's either something that has to do with money or it has to do with your heart. <laughs> okay, it's usually money or your heart. You know, why you feel stupid? Because that's an emotion that's like I feel tricked, like I exposed myself when I shouldn't have exposed myself and I basically got fooled. Okay, so that's either your money or that's your heart because it's usually the two things that people normally feel 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 stupid about. So I just asked her, I said, is it a significant other, someone that you like, or is it something with regard to money? And she said, oh, my God, how'd you know? <laughs> it was a scam with regard to money. <laughs> and I said, I just know, I said, I've been here for 12 years. And as you, you know, allowing wisdom to kick in, 12 years, I have seen people go through this. And when they normally get embarrassed, like I said, there's usually two things. It's either your money or it's your heart. It's something to deal with the relationship. And she basically got scammed, but she figured out the scam uh, fast. And she, instead of losing $1,000, she only lost $21. Okay. So she said she felt stupid. So I actually told her, and you know, anybody who knows me closely knows, you know, like my rhyming partner, B. I won't tell y'all his business, you know, that's, that's for him to tell if he wants to. But he had something similar happen to him this year. And so I said, you know what, I'm going to tell you what happened to my, to my guy. And I guarantee you, when I tell you his story, it's going to make you feel better about how, how you feel about yourself. <laughs> and I did, no disrespect, you know, like that's my man, you know, I love you. You know, but I told her what happened to him. And I explained the different dynamics of what happened. In the story. And so what I want her to understand is most people who scam you like that probably do a little bit of research on you. So they know so so they know how to tap into your emotions. So they basically know how to play you. So let's say if you are a person who's been poor your whole life, then usually what they do, like they target you because they know that you want money. If you are already in college debt, then I'm going to target you and talk to you about you having a job for you to make quick and fast money. So that means that's a trigger. Like you want money. That's what I'm saying. They actually play you. They, they, they play with that emotion. Let's say if you've been to jail or if you've been to prison, if someone wanted to get you to do something to mess with you, then they can threaten you about going back to jail. Have you seen what a, a person does when you step on that trigger or when you pull it? It's, it's just like I said with regard to diversity to some people. When the topic comes up, they get an IQ drop. It's like they get stupid. Like they don't know what to do with it. You know, and when you tap onto it, you tap into that emotion. You know, it's just like love. You ever been in love and the relationship fell apart, whether you've been married or whether you and then got divorced or you dated somebody for a long time and then and then it was over. What happens when you meet someone that almost helps you to feel that way again. I'm talking about like kind of like more so like that loving feeling. You feel kind of you feel kind of exposed and vulnerable because you're like, can I do this? Or let's say if you've been in a relationship and then they bring out that feeling of let's say if you ever felt unsafe before in your life. Like I know I have triggers from when I was a child where I felt unsafe and I felt unloved in a way. And if you do something, if you step on that trigger, you bring about something that comes natural to me. You almost, you bring the animal out. Like, no, you know, I want to protect myself. I want to be free. I don't want to be constricted. I want you to get away from me. Stop. You know, I like, don't take away my freedom because I want to feel free. And what I'm saying is that in the church, we need to start doing a better job of at least addressing people's human condition besides just talking about the spiritual condition and making us want to be overly spiritual. Give us an opportunity to be human so that we can... Do what Jesus did, meet people where they are so we can bring them or help usher them into where they need to be. Um, and I'm going to talk about this. I'm going to mention this this one thing and then I'm going to get ready to close because I got because I have 10 minutes left. And I really hope that the point is being made and I hope that I'm, you know, helping you in a way or maybe, you know, giving you a different way of thinking about it. The way that the church talks about sexual orientation, I think is totally whack. Okay, I think it's totally wet the way that we think about it, the way the church doctrine is so anti, in my opinion, it's so anti-gay, anti-lesbian, anti-bisexual, anti-transgender, anti-anything heterosexual. And what we try to do in the church is we try to use the, 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 the critical scripture that most people use is Leviticus 18.22. You know, and they try to use that to justify 
saying why gay people are an abomination and they're going to hell and it's not natural to us and so on and so forth. But you know what I, but see, here's something that I understand. And I think everybody out here will agree with me. You're not in control of who you like. Just let that sink in for about seven to 10 seconds. You don't control who you like. You know, remember when I made that statement and now, now this is not about sexuality, what I'm getting ready to say. This is just about likeness now. So let me, Pause there. Leave that alone to come over here because I don't want people to think that I'm tying it to that. But have you ever liked somebody? And if this was an ideal world or if you felt like you were in your right mind, if you really thought about it, you might be like, I probably wouldn't have tried to holler at them if I didn't feel, remember what I said, hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. So it's like when your mind isn't in the right place sometimes. And when I say right place, I mean where you are 100% feeling how you're feeling. You are in tune with who you are. You're, you are in this, what I like to say, in the will of God. When you're thinking clearly and correctly. Some of us can say some people that we probably have been with, share intimacy with, or even, you know, maybe had, you know, sexual experience with. You know, like if you turn around and look back at it, some of y'all might actually say, oh, Lord, if I was in my right mind, I would have never tried to holler at them. About, hey, what's going on from France? Hey, uh, I would have never tried to get with them. You know, I would have never tried tried to do that, right? Because in my right mind, I'm like, in my right mind, I know my sense tells me that that that, that, that situation wouldn't have gone nowhere. I would have never tried to talk to them, you see? So I want to go back to talking about how we like people. Who you like, you don't control. The only thing you control is what you do with it, you see? And so this is why I say that we, you know, as a church, we as a community need to do a better job of identifying the human condition. Now, let's deal with the human condition for, for a moment, which is what do most people want when we just think about it humanly? I want my ego stroked. I want to feel like I do everything right. I want to be in control of everything. I, want, I like to think that I'm right. Sometimes you like to be the center of attention. Or some of us don't want to be the center at all. Like, don't even look at me. Some of us like to do actions with no repercussions. I want what I want when I want it. And the one that's really big is look out for myself. Now, I want you to think about that with turn in terms of what Jesus told his disciples. The, the number one commandment or the biggest commandment that Jesus gave the disciples is to love God with your heart, soul, and mind. And the second is like unto it, which is love your neighbor as yourself. That's Matthew 22, 37 through 42. And he also said, hang all other commandments under this one. Okay. And that is because right now in our human state, it is not natural for us to love something that we can't see with everything because we operate off of what we see for the most part. And then to love your neighbor as yourself means I'm going to treat somebody like I would treat myself. The truth is that doesn't come natural. However, I got to say this, however, if you change up your situation and change up what your mind is focused on long enough, you can make it your natural circumstance or your natural situation. I'll give you an example. Babies are not, babies are born into this world with a huge capacity to love. That's why most babies can play with other babies. You know, there's an ounce of selfishness in them. You know, as they get older, they want what they want. But when a baby is like four, five, six, seven, eight years old, they're not looking at people in, in, in a different stance like something's wrong with them. They just notice it and they want to learn more about it. But as time goes on and they get groomed and socialized to see themselves as different than somebody else or somebody else is worse than them, then, they, then that comparison starts. And then they start seeing that other person is different than them. Therefore, if you're different than me, then me and you maybe don't get along. And depending on how the parents taught them, that difference may add a different kind of a value. So then that's how you become a racist individual. That's how you become a sexist individual. And it becomes natural to you. And what I want to say is that what Jesus did is when Jesus came into the earth and when Jesus went into the wilderness in particular, he made being not dependent on materials natural to him. He made being totally dependent on God natural to him. He made being a person that loved people and wanted to bring love to the world natural to him because that's what the world needs more of is more love. And Jesus understood that. That's why he always tried to appeal to the human condition. He didn't talk to you when you were hungry. He would feed you and then talk to you. If you felt lonely, he would help you feel safe at first. Then he would talk to you. That's what he did with the woman at the well. Like, let it be known that you can talk to me. I'm going to challenge you in a minute, but 
I'm going to be open to you. Or when he saved the woman who's about to be stoned um, for committing adultery. No, we're not going to stone her for, for committing adultery. Let's, let's actually address what's actually going on with her because if it's just a mistake that she made, then let's help her to not make the mistake again. And so he spoke to the human side of her. So let me close with this. Galatians 5, 22 through, through 26. Okay, it says, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, and it gets such there is no law. Okay, against this there is no law. All right, but if you go back in that same scripture before those verses, if you don't have the spirit, it actually gives you the opposite of what you are actually doing. As a matter of fact. Let me pull it open real real quick just so that I can read it live before we get off. Because I thought because as I was working on it uh, um, this week and I was reading it, I just found it really, really, really interesting how basically that scripture gives you, it gives you what the fruit of the spirit is. But what it also does, it says that if you are led, not led by the spirit and you led by the flesh, it said these things are manifest adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like of the which I tell you before, as, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So this is just my opinion about this is that when you don't focus on God, you will go back to your natural state. And this is why we need to promote more love in this world because love actually does come natural to us. It's just that it's been tainted by this world. Love and caring for other people can come natural to us. It's just been tainted by selfishness. Love and caring for someone else can come natural to us. It's just that it's been tainted by fear. And so what we have to do is help people to not be afraid of each other and help people not see each other as you're different than me and help people understand that I want the same thing that you want. It's just that we can get it together if we stop seeing each other like we're so different from each other. So I want to close by saying thank you to John Stewart for what John Stewart said the other day. What's going on? I want to thank John Stewart for pointing out that the United States is not natural, is not normal. But what the United States is, it's an idea that if we work together, that idea can come to fruition because we're working together, because we are helping each other, because we're seeing each other as brothers and sisters. We're seeing each other as human and not seeing each other like you're different than me. And I really feel like as a Christian, the example of Christ has been the best example for me to see people that way. It's been other examples like, um, you know, like a Gandhi. Um, like a Frida. Um, there have been a number of other examples in every culture, male and female, that there's always someone who gets this idea. And they understand that we can work and persist together if we come together. And they understand that because they don't look at you like you're my enemy and they don't look at you like you're my competition. I look at you as though you are my help and we can support each other. And when we can see it that way, we'll work better together. So I invite you, if you're in Raleigh, Durham, Come out, 2810 Cakes Avenue with the C. That's the African American Cultural Center at 11 a.m. Uh, we'll be having Peace Church, and we'll be going into this a little bit deeper, obviously, because we'll be in church. And remember, this is St. Polymera's birthday. So if you're in the area, don't forget to come out at 4 o'clock, Lion Park out in Durham, North Carolina. Remember, that's L-Y-O-N. And if you like good, positive hip-hop, check me out on November 29th as I'm releasing uh, my, my album, A Conversation with Polymera to the World. And um, you can go ahead and download it earlier, and you can go ahead and get access to songs now. I thank you for logging on with me this morning. You all be blessed. Be peace. Remember, follow me, Rashad Ease, Twitter, Snapchat, Instagram. My website, RashadEasley.com, YouTube.com forward slash R-A-S-H-A-A-D-I, or email me, Thomas R. Easley at EasleyBranch.com. Hope you got something from this. Be blessed. Talk to y'all again. I won't be around next week because it's Thanksgiving. I'll be with friends and family. So I'll be back with you all in December. But I may, if you follow me on Facebook, jump on Facebook this week because I'll definitely be, 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 uh, be putting some things up there or follow me on my YouTube channel. I'll talk to y'all soon. Peace.